Welcome to First Baptist Church. You're listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead. Please check us out on the internet at fbcboron.org. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. And the word of the Sovereign Lord reads, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Benjamin Keach's Baptist Catechism asks a question, and the answer to that question is this. Men's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So I want to welcome you back to this short series on the five solas of the Reformation. And as we have been talking about, we are using this time, these last few weeks, to prepare our hearts for Easter, which is next Sunday. And we're doing so by spending some time thinking through the foundational truths about the gospel, truths that at one time were lost due to the evolution of church tradition, but truths nonetheless that were recaptured during the 16th and the 17th centuries during a period known as the Reformation. And this is the final installment of this short series as we celebrate Palm Sunday today. And in our time together, we have we've covered a lot of ground in the past several weeks. And if you have missed any of the parts of this series, my encouragement for you this week is to take a little bit of time and go back. And you can go to our YouTube channel. We're posting all that stuff there. Uh, or you can go to our SoundCloud page if you want to listen that way. But listen to the parts of the series that you have missed. And in fact, I would even say that it'd be worth, well worth going back and listening to all the parts again. Because I believe it is very important that we revisit these timeless truths of the gospel over and over again. In fact, I promise you... It will be edifying to you. But, but with that being said, I just want to briefly summarize for you where we've been to give you a little bit of context of where we're going. October 31st, 1517, a day that changed the world. And the reason why is because Martin Luther, with a desire to have a public debate, nailed a document to the church door at Wittenberg, Germany, a document called the 95 Thesis. You see, Martin Luther was a devout Augustinian monk who was trying to the best of his ability to make himself right with God by his own effort and also by obeying all that the Catholic Church and her traditions were teaching him to do. But the harder he worked and the more he tried, the guiltier he felt. And he became painfully aware that he could not do enough to assuage God's justice and wrath against him. But one day he was reading the book of Romans and he came across a truth about the gospel that stood in contrast to all that he had been taught. It was Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 that says very clearly, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. You see, for centuries, the church taught that if you were to be righteous before God, you certainly needed to have faith in God, but you also needed to be baptized, and you must have confession and to receive sacraments of the church and pray to Mary and the saints and all these other church traditions to be saved. Over the centuries, justification in the Catholic church became about something you know, that you had to do not just about faith. It became about rites and religious rituals prescribed by the church. And so according to the church, you had to, the righteous did live by faith, but, but also the other stuff as well. And during the Reformation, the truth about the gospel, the simplicity of the gospel was recovered. Salvation is not about the other stuff. Salvation is about what God has done for us that we cannot do for ourselves. And out of the Reformation comes this little Latin word, sola. Sola, which means only or alone. 
You see, the, the, the church at the time agreed with the reformers. They said, yes, you must have faith in Christ to be justified. But the church throughout history kept adding to that. Yes, you must have faith in Christ to be justified, but, but that's not enough by itself to be justified. You need more than just faith. You need, you need more than Christ because faith in Christ are not sufficient enough to save you. You need more than grace. You need more than, than Christ himself. You need the church. You need traditions and sacraments and the saints and good works. That is what the church was teaching and continues to teach to this day. But the reformers, emboldened by the clear teaching of the scriptures, pushed back on that and said, no, Christ in Christ alone is sufficient. Faith is sufficient. Grace is sufficient. The word of God is sufficient to tell us what we need to be saved. And so the reformers took the, the word sola and used it in a way to communicate the heart of the gospel, the truth about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so out of that came five Latin slogans or five sola statements to help to communicate and teach the life-saving message about Jesus Christ. And the first one was sola scriptura. The word of God alone is our final objective standard for truth. Not church traditions, not councils, not church hierarchy, not the opinions of men, not our emotions, not even the government, and not our culture. The Word of God alone by itself is the final authority on truth in all doctrine. And by the way, that's just as relevant today as it was 500 years ago. Out of that, the scriptures, we discovered that you were saved by sola gratia, or grace alone. We are not saved because we deserve it. We are not saved because of our good deeds somehow outweighing our bad deeds. We are not saved because we are religious and we observe all the rituals. We are saved by the grace of God in that alone. Our salvation is a free gift that God has given us, and we receive that gift through sola fide, or faith alone. We don't receive our justification by earning it. We don't receive justification by, by doing something to make God like us. We don't, we don't keep the gift of salvation by our own works. We receive the gift of eternal life, and we receive that justification by faith alone, apart from anything else. And the object of that faith is solus Christus, or Christ alone. The object of our faith is not the church, though we love the church. The object of the church, I mean, excuse me, the object of our faith is, is not tradition, though we love traditions. The object of our faith is not a set of rituals. The object of our faith is, is the one who can actually deliver on the promise to save us. The object of our faith is Jesus Christ, God the Son in the flesh. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And brothers and sisters, that right there is the heart of the gospel that was rediscovered during the Protestant Reformation. It is sola gratia through sola fide in solus Christus. And let us never get tired of saying it, brothers and sisters. You were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Period. And that is made clear for us by our only final authority of truth, and that is Scripture alone. And that is what we talked about for the last four weeks. And hopefully, in four weeks, you've learned a little bit of Latin. Maybe. Well, today, we're going to wrap up this series on the Reformation with perhaps, I think, the most important of all of these sola statements. Soli Deo Gloria, or the glory of God alone. And it might surprise you that I would say that this is the most important of all the statements, right? But the truth is, it is. It is the most important. And you might wonder why. Because the truth is, we cannot overstate the importance of people learning the truth about, about the, the fact that man is not saved by his own efforts, but simply by grace through faith. I mean, that is super important, right? But what about Solus Christus? Christ is the one, right? He's the most important person in all of human history. There's, he's the most important person who's ever lived. Why isn't Solus Christus the most important of these statements? Well, the grace of God is important because it is how God 
extends justification to mankind. And faith is important because that's how we receive the gift of justification. And Jesus is important because He is the anchor and the object of our faith. He is the one who bridges the gap to make salvation possible. But solely Deo Gloria, or the glory of God, that gets us to the ultimate reason why salvation is even possible. Because without it, I want you to hear me, without the glory of God, not only is salvation impossible, but it's pointless without it. You see, what we need to understand, the thing that we need to come to terms with is the gospel and justification and all of these solas. What we have to just embrace and take to heart is ultimately these things are not about us. It's not about you. I want you to just let that soak into your heart for a minute. It's not about you. Your salvation, though it is for you, it's not about you. And I know that might seem counterintuitive, but that is the absolute truth. It is not about you. The gospel and the reformation and these five solo statements that change the world, they give us so much hope. Ultimately, none of these things is about us or anyone else. They are about God. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is a truth that is so easily lost in this culture. So I don't know if you heard and saw on Facebook, like this, it just blows my mind. We live at a point that this is possible. There's a rapper, you know, which never makes sense to me anyway, but it's a whole different story. But there's a rapper because he wants to do a publicity stunt. He has created with the help of a creator. They took some basically some basic Nike shoes and they have artistically changed these shoes and they call them Satan shoes. So they have like these this bronze pentagrams on them and they've got painted 666 on there and they're injecting drops of human blood in the soles of the shoes and they're red and it is, I mean, in our culture, like, is just okay with this. Now, can you imagine 30 years ago, like somebody doing something like that? It's just, it's dumb. But I mean, our culture has lost the truth that it's all about him. But I'm gonna hear, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, this truth that it's all about God is also lost in church today as well. Many parts of the church. When I say the church, I'm not saying all of them, but I'm saying there's a general cultural Christianity that pervades America. In fact, the truth has been forgotten and has led many churches and denominations to become more about people rather than God himself. The center of many people's theology has become people-centered and not God-centered. And if you don't believe me, just listen to the preaching that's popular on television. Listen to the most people, popular preachers on YouTube. It is all men-centered. Just listen to the, the central messages that are being preached. God wants you to live your best life now. Why? Because it's about you. God is happy when you're happy. I heard a preacher say that. God is happy when you're happy. Because it's so Jesus died on the cross. That's okay. But you, he didn't want you to be unhappy, right? God is, this is the one that blows me away. This is actually really popular. God has a wonderful plan for your life. Okay, did you tell that to Pharaoh? Because that was part of God's plan too. Didn't work out so good for him, but. Right? If, if, if you'll just sow some money into this ministry, if you'll just send some money to this ministry, then I promise you God will make sure that you are healthy, wealthy, and happy. Because you know God wouldn't want you to be poor. You know that God is a gentleman. He would never do anything against your, against your will. <laughs> right? You know, God's sovereignty is li- limited by your free will. Right? You know, in fact, God can't even work in your life unless you allow Him to. I, and, and these are all very popular repeated themes that you will hear over and over again. Preaching in many churches today by the biggest name preachers is patently men-centered. It's not God-centered. And it's the same with much of what's so-called Christian music. I praise the Lord. There's a lot of great Christian music, and there's a lot of great people, people who are producing great songs about God. But there's so many songs, when you listen to them, you think, this is not even about Him. This is about me walking down some road through a stormy night. It's like, isn't that the repeated theme? It's like an old country song over and over again. 
So much of Christian culture in the church has made the, the, the Christian faith about us rather than about God. But the truth is, in spite of all this, it is not about us. It's not about you. Now, please understand, these sola statements do affect you. You are indeed the recipient of the grace of God through faith in Christ. Praise the Lord for that, right? right? And yes, you were justified on the basis of grace alone and not and, and through your faith. And yes, Christ died to make atonement for your sins personally. But hear me, even that ultimately is not about you. It's about God and it always has been. And this is such an important truth for us to come to terms with and to actually take ownership of in our own lives because we live in this individualistic culture that says it's all about you. That's the American mantra. Right? The world that is at war with God Himself will tell you over and over again and whisper in your ear, it's about you, it's about you. Culture says it's about you, right? Because your job's about you. Your family is about you. Your stuff is about you. Your money is about you. Your time is about you. Your attention is about you. Your hobbies are about you. Social media is about you. And that's what we're told when we're growing up, right? It's all about you. In fact, there's a whole new generation that's becoming adults that have, are living the life of, we've been telling them, it's all about you. And then we wonder why they're throwing such a fit, right? It's even every marketer's job is to tell you that it's all about you. Every company has an angle to sell you something and they know that they can convince you if they can convince you that it's about you. They tell you, you need what they're selling. In fact, more than that, you deserve what they're selling. You deserve to have this. You deserve to feel this way. You deserve the new car. You deserve to look good in those clothes because it's about you. The world revolves around you is what every company is telling you. And much of the church has bought in the same idea. Hence, the seeker-sensitive movement in the American church. Let's make church fun. Let's, let's make church more comfortable for non-believers. Let's, let's not talk so much about sin and repentance and, and let's spend more time talking about you know, how to live a better life. Let's not talk about theology and the attributes of God, but instead let's talk about eight ways to have better relationships. Why? Because we want to attract more people because church is about them. That's the rationale. And it has been for about 40 years. And the way of thinking, this way of thinking has infected our theology in the church. In fact, let me ask you a question. And I want you to know this is not an indictment, but I just want you to help me to think through this. And, and it's a simple question, but it's a question that, that a lot of people tend to get wrong. And I have gotten this wrong many times. Lots of years I've answered this the wrong way. And the question is this, why did Christ come to the earth? What was the purpose of him coming to the earth? It's the purpose. Now, people in the church today will say, well, Jesus came to earth to be our example. And some will say that Jesus came to earth to show us what love looks like. Some people say that Jesus came to the, to the earth to walk in our shoes. And, and some will even say that Jesus came to the earth, as I have said so many times, Jesus came to the earth to save us from our sins. In fact, that's what most people will say. The purpose of Jesus coming to the earth is to save us from our sins. And I want you to hear me. That is incorrect. Bear with me now. That is not the ultimate purpose of Christ coming to the earth. Please understand these things were certainly part of his mission. Right? His mission on the earth was absolutely to save us from our sins. That was his mission. His mission was to be our an example. His mission was to walk in our shoes. Saving us from our sin was the task that he had to accomplish, and he accomplished that while he was on the earth. But hear me, that was not the purpose of Christ coming to the earth. There's a difference between his purpose and his mission. And before you get upset, I want you to hear me out on this. I want you, to, I want you to think through with me. You being saved from your sins is an effect and is a consequence of Christ coming to the earth. It is not the purpose of Him coming to the earth. Your justification right, is an important consequence of Christ coming to the earth is actually the means that God is using to achieve His purpose. But it's not the purpose itself. You see, yes, Christ died on the cross. And yes, he lived a perfect life 
that you couldn't live. And yes, he fulfilled the law on your behalf and he kept the covenant of works that you couldn't keep. And he took upon himself the sin that you have carried around on the cross. And he tur- in return, he gives you his righteousness. And he suffered and died because he loves you and he knows you personally. And he set you free from both the penalty and the power of sin and he offers you eternal life through faith in him. All of that is absolutely the truth, but ultimately, Christ didn't do that for you. This is where we have to become God-centered. He did this for something much bigger than you and much bigger than me. This is the place we need to change our minds. This is where we need to let go of self-centered theology. Christ did all that He did for a much bigger reason than for you and for your life. The reason why Christ died on the cross, the purpose of that sacrifice on your behalf was ultimately something bigger and grander and more important than all of us. He did all of that for soli deo glory, gloria, for the glory of God alone. That is the reason why he did what he did. That is the purpose That's why he died. That's why Christ came to the earth and suffered in the most horrific manner. It was to glorify God. Jesus glorified God the Father through his life and his death on the cross and the resurrection, making a way for you to be saved by grace. Your salvation was not the purpose of Christ's coming. Your salvation was the means by which God achieved his purpose, which ultimately was to glorify the Father. Your salvation and the salvation of every person who God redeems is the means to a greater, more glorious end. And that end is the glory of God. You see, God does everything He does for His glory. You were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for soli deo gloria, for the glory of God alone. Christian, you and I need to take this to heart and stop thinking that the world and our lives individually are centered on us. This is the changing principle that will change the way that you think about God. If you begin to see that it is not about you, but it's about Him, you were not saved for you. You were not saved simply so that you could be saved. You certainly weren't saved because you deserve it. You were saved in spite of the fact that you don't deserve it. Hear me. You were saved because God in heaven is glorified by saving you. Let that truth just kind of settle into your heart. The big, gigantic implications behind that. You were saved by God because it brings Him glory. See, you weren't created for you. You were created to glorify Him. All of creation was not created so that it could just simply exist. All of creation was created for a purpose to bring overwhelming glory to the one who created it all. Romans chapter 11 makes this really clear. Beginning in verse 33, Paul in his little doxology Romans 11, beginning verse 33, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been His counselor, or who has given Him a gift that He might be repaid for? And I want you to hear this. For from Him, and through Him, and to Him are what? All things, all things, to Him be glory forever. Amen. All of creation, all of creation is about the glory of God. Revelation 4, verse 11 says, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power For you created what? All things. And by your will they existed and were created. 
God is worshipped and glorified because He is the Creator. All creation is about Him. All of creation was brought into existence to glorify God. The covenant and plan of redemption that God had conceived in eternity past that brought you into salvation is about God and His glory. Christ coming to the earth is about God and His glory. Your life that you live today with your family, the way that you raise your children, the way that you go to work, the way that you come and worship, the way that you treat other people, all of that is intended to bring glory to God. You were saved to glorify God. In fact, Benjamin Keach's catechism asks some important questions. In fact, uh, Keech's Catechism is, uh, is a document that was written to help teach and communicate the truths that were recovered in the Reformation, and it actually teaches the foundational theology that was written in the 1689 Second London Com uh, Baptist Confession of Faith. Uh, I think it's a document well worth reading, but it's a document that helps to teach future generations the truth about the Christian faith, and it does so in a question-and-answer format. And the very first question the Catechism asks is this, who is the first and best of beings? And the answer is God is the first and best of beings. And then the very next question, it goes from God and it goes to man. What is the chief end of man? In other words, what's the purpose of man? Why are we here? What were we created for? And the answer that in the catechism is man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Right? If, if that's all you hear from me today and that's all you learn is to realize that you were created, the chief purpose that you're here on the earth for, the, in fact, you want to know what the meaning of life is? Right there it is. Glorify God and enjoy Him forever. It's to answer all your questions right there. Man was created to glorify God by his life, and in so doing, treasuring God forever. It is our purpose in life. That's the reason why we exist, to value him and to glorify him and to love him above all things. That is the purpose of mankind. That is the purpose of all creation. That is your individual, your purpose. Men himself was created for that. That's why God created the universe in the first place. But then, we, as we know, something happened, right? Man decided somewhere along the way that he would not glorify God, but instead glorify other things, particularly himself. Man deci mankind decided to make his life and everything else about him instead of God. In fact, that's the essence of what we saw in the garden If you have your Bibles, turn with me really quick to Genesis chapter 3. It's easy to find. It's front of the Bible. Genesis chapter 3, by the way, I think Genesis should be required reading for everybody, this is my opinion. Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, we read, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, You may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. And then he says, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God. And there, brothers and sisters, is the temptation. You will be like God. You will be elevated and glorified like God. You, puny human being, can share in God's glory is the essence of what he's saying. It's not about God's glory. It's about your glory. And, 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 and believe me, isn't that like us? Come on. We want the credit. Right? We want the recognition. We want on some level the glory. We get irritated when someone takes credit for our ideas. Right? We, we, we get our feelings hurt when people forget to tell us happy birthday. Right? We, we, we instinctively want the glory. Right? And it's bred into us in the, even in our youth. Right? I mean, it's just part of who we are. I mean, when I was uh, a little bit younger, I used to actually coach football, and I would see it all the time. 
The fact of the matter is, is if you know anything about football, the most important job, in my opinion, on the field is the one is, is blocking, right? Because if you don't have people who can actually block at least a little bit, right, it didn't matter how fast your athletes are, it's just going to be a rough game, right? But here's the thing. All these little kids, <laughs> they don't want to block. Everybody wants to run the ball, right? Why? Because only one kid can score a touchdown, right? Everybody wants to score the touchdowns. Everybody wants the glory. But here's the thing. It's not limited to just players. Parents are just as bad. Little Timmy is five foot one tall and five foot one around, right? And he's not very fast, and he can barely get down a three-point stance, but mom and dad have dreams that he's going to be a quarterback someday. <laughs> Ask Coach Mike about that. He'll tell you. That was the temptation for Eve. I want to be like God. When God created the world, the Bible says it was very good, and Adam and Eve lived in a state where God's purposes could be fulfilled. God's glory was evident, and mankind was able to enjoy God directly. He was able to live with God in an up-close personal relationship. I mean, mankind literally walked with God. He lived in a perfect world where God's glory was evident all around and he could enjoy God in ways that we can't even imagine. I mean, Dinah Wise this last week asked, you know, how that relationship was. Like, and, I, and we talked about the fact that it is more glorious than we can even like fathom right now. But all that changed because of Adam and Eve, because God, because God's purpose was not enough for them. They wanted to be like God. They wanted not to simply glorify God, but glorify themselves too. For them, creation and their lives was no longer about God and His glory. It was about them and their glory. And the result, they rebelled and all of creation was thrown into chaos. Sin and death entered the world and pain and destruction followed. And mankind was separated from God, became spiritually dead, and as a result, unable to fulfill that purpose, unable to fulfill His chief end. He was unable to glorify God and enjoy Him. But notice this. I want you to see this. When mankind was able to fulfill that purpose, when he was able to glorify God, things were perfect. You understand that, right? Things were good when they were able to do what they were supposed to do, and when they were doing what they were supposed to do. But when he decided to glorify himself rather than God, when that's when everything went wrong. When mankind made it about himself instead of God, everything went sideways. And that's and what is worse is not only did mankind not glorify God, in the process he became incapable of doing so. Ephesians 2 tells us, as we have spent some time on a couple weeks ago, mankind became spiritually dead, incapable of glorifying God, and incapable of enjoying Him on His own. We lost the active ability to glorify God and enjoy Him. That's why Christ was sent. God sent Christ to restore what was broken. We need to remember right, that the garden is the picture of what it was supposed to be like. Right? Christ came to restore what was broken. He sent Christ so that God and man could once again have a relationship with Him. He came so that man was capable once again of actually glorifying God and living in a way that he could enjoy Him. The whole reason for Christ coming to the earth, again, is to bring glory to God. The reason why Christ died on the cross is for the glory of His Father and your salvation. Your individual salvation is a means to that. Your salvation is a restoration. I want you to hear this. Your, re your salvation is a restoration to the, to the way things were supposed to be, right? But then as an extra bonus, being, God being glorified in your life is actually what's best for you. Do you realize that? What's best for you ultimately is not even what's about you. Your salvation is... It's not about you. It's about God and His glory. But hear me, right? He was glorified when you were saved. Not only did your eternal life begin, not only did He send you the Holy Spirit to come and live inside of you and guide you and comfort you and strengthen you, 
Not only was the, the promise of God made for you and given to you that He would never leave you or forsaken you, but God Himself was glorified when you individually were saved. And that, hear me, is what was best for you. That's why you were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. The purpose of your salvation, the purpose of Christ on the cross was to restore the purpose for your life, which is to bring glory to God and you personally to enjoy Him forever. Which may cause some of us to ask then, what, okay, what is the glory of God then? What, what, I mean, you keep saying the word glory of God, but what does that even mean? And, and what does that have to do with me enjoying Him? That's a good question. Because the glory of God, I think, is something we talk about all the time. And it's something that I believe that most of us have, I think, a little bit of a handle on. That we, I think we all have a feeling of what it is, but, but, and, and, but I don't think we all fully can grasp it. I mean, I think most of us relate God's glory to some form of radiance. I think that would be safe to say. That we think of God's glory as light and, and beauty. And I think that we can think about God being, I mean, people being awestruck by God's glory and awesomeness. I think most of us have kind of that sense, but re the reality is, if I were to ask you to write down a definition of the glory of God, I think you, like me, would probably struggle to define it in words. I believe we all would struggle to define it. The, the fact of the matter is, the glory of God is a big abstract idea that encompasses a really great deal of creation. In fact, His glory, like Himself, defies simple definitions. I mean, think about this. The Bible gives us a sense that God's glory in some way, is visible to the human eye. Moses in Exodus 33, 18 says to God, show me your glo glory. Moses wanted to visibly, with his own eyes, see God's glory. Exodus 24, 17 tells us that the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. It was obviously visible in some way. Psalm 19.1 tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God, which we know to be true, right? When you look at the stars at nighttime, when you, when you see a beautiful sunrise or a wonderful sunset, or when you, you know, because of our technology today, praise the Lord, we can look at these incredible images that come from the Hubble telescope that see the distant reaches of the universe. Tell me that you're not struck with awe and wonder the heavens do declare the glory of God. And, and, and so the glory of God seems to be associated with light and beauty and visible things and breathtaking grandeur. But the Bible tells us that there's more to it than just that. In fact, when Jesus was outstanding the tomb, outstanding outside the tomb of Lazarus, he said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Now, obviously, Jesus is not talking about bright lights coming out of the tomb. right? He was talking about seeing Lazarus raised from the dead. He was talking about her witnessing firsthand God's mighty power, the power with which He can bring the dead back to life. God's miracles our visible manifestation of His glory. But again, there's still more to that than, than just that. Because John said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14, he says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John said, we have seen His glory. We have seen it. What glory? Remember, Jesus was transfigured on the mountain, as Mark tells us. Jesus exhibited God's radiant glory. In fact, Paul even says in Hebrews, he says of Jesus that He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. So, so think about this. God's glory is radiant light. God's glory is beauty and creation. God's glory is His miraculous life-giving power. God's glory is Jesus Christ Himself. You see, this is a big idea. And, it, there's, and if it weren't enough, there's still actually more. Romans 3.23 actually tells us that we have, for all have sinned and fall short of, of what? The glory of God. You see, the glory of God is not just light. It is something 
we can fall short of when we sin. But this tells us the glory of God has something to do also within His holiness. Which makes sense because Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 6.3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And we would think that it would say, the whole earth is filled full of His holiness. But that's not what it says. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full, is full of His what? His glory. Meditate on that for a second. The whole earth is filled with God's glory. Why? Because God Himself is completely holy. I don't want to lose you in the theological weeds here on Sunday morning. It's a bit early for that, right? That's also why I teach a theology class on Wednesday nights, so we can get a little deeper into the stuff. And you ask some of my, t- my students, they'll tell you, we get into the weeds pretty deep. <laughs> Thank you for that. But I think we're beginning to see the root of, of God's glory. You see, the words holy and glory have an underlying idea that actually tie them and connect them together. The under, idea, underlying idea that we don't see when, in the words when we read them in English. But this underlying idea, if we can identify it and understand it, it will help us to make sense of why God's glory is so important and why bringing God glory to God leads to us enjoying Him. You see, the word holy means consecrated or set apart. That's what it literally means. I spent a whole hour on this su- subject in our theology class. It means to be separated from the rest. When God says to consecrate yourself, He means set yourself apart. Holiness, right? This is where holiness points to, is being separated. In fact, one of the Greek words for holiness literally means different. It means unlike anything else. It means special. That's really the theme behind holiness. When we say that God is holy, we're saying that He is completely unique and different and special. He's unlike anything else. In fact, we sing that all the time. There's nothing or no one like you. He's one of a kind. He is set apart. And to carry this a bit further, we we understand that when something is unique, right? when something is one of a kind, when something is beautiful, the epitome of beauty, and, it's, and there's only one of a kind. What do we, we say about that? It is, is also valuable. right? That's what it means for God to be holy. He is infinitely valuable. Now with that in mind, let us consider then the word holy in that context. The word holy in the Greek is from the word doxa. This is where we get the word doxology from. It means honor or renowned or glory or an especially divine quality, right? But what we need to realize is at its core, the word doxa comes from a word that means heavy. Now, that might seem strange to you, but you need to understand that this idea heavy is related to the idea of scales, of scales to measure something with. So you put something in one side of the scale, right? And then you put weights in the other side in order to determine value. That's the word doxa for glory. It means the value of God. And what we're trying to say here is God is so glorious that you put him in the scale over here, there's not enough weight to put in this side here to equal him. Does that follow, make sense? That's the idea of doxa, right? His heaviness equates to being valuable. This word applied to God's glory conveys the idea that God is infinitely Valuable. He has intrinsic, infinite worth, a value un, un, that we're unable to even come to terms with. God's glory is a manifestation of his worth. That's why we worship him. The word worship means worthship. He's worthy. We sang that this morning. You alone are worthy. You see, God, his glory and holiness are related. God's holiness means He is absolutely unique and one of a kind. His glory means there's nothing equal to Him in value. That's what it's all about. God's worth. God's true value. God is the most valuable thing in all of creation. I'm going to say that again because I don't think we ever think about this near enough. God is the most valuable thing in all of creation more valuable than all the money in the world, more valuable than all the fame that you can muster, more valuable than all the social media followers that follow you, more valuable 
than anything else in all of creation. Because think about this. If you personally didn't exist, what happens to the universe? I'm sorry to say, but not a whole lot. Okay? Just be honest. I mean, the fact is, it's going to affect your friends and your family, right? It'll affect them a lot. And, and, and guess what? It'll create a little wrinkle throughout history because you influence events whether you realize it or not. But the fact of the matter is, beyond that, there's not much else that's going to happen, right? Your non-existence does not affect the lunar orbit, right? Your non-existence does not affect the gravitational constant that holds the universe together. Your non-existence doesn't affect the speed of light. So the truth is, if you didn't exist, it's a minor consequence to the universe. But what if God didn't exist? What then? If God didn't exist, then nothing else could exist. Not time, not space, not matter or energy, not even light or darkness, not cold or hot. Nothing would exist. Nothing. That is an abstraction you can't even relate to. Think about what nothing is. And then you think of a blank, empty room, and even that's something, right? God is the only self-existent being in all of the universe. He is the only thing that is independent of all other things. And that means all other things have their existence in Him. Everything else in the universe exists because of Him. And that means everything else gets its value from Him because He is the one who made them. Let that just sink in for just a second. Everything in the universe gets its value not in of itself. Nothing has its own intrinsic value by itself. It gets its value from the one who made it, which means God is infinitely valuable. God is infinitely worthy. God's holiness means He is valuable because He is one of a kind. There's nothing and no one like Him. He is of inestimable worth because He is, by very definition, the definition of goodness. He is the very definition of love. He is the full embodiment of grace and mercy. All good is derivative of the goodness of Him. Right? He alone creates all that's good. Remember, Genesis tells us that when God finished creating the universe, that it was very good. Well, God is infinitely greater than all creation. He is infinite and unending. And so all of the universe, the entire scope of the cosmos, finds all of its value in Him because He is all valuable. And that's what His holiness means. And the Bible also tells us that God's glory is the visible manifestation of that worth. That's what we're seeing, is the visible manifestation of that worth, the weight of His worth. John Piper spends a lot of time talking about this particular subject, and he says that God says of this, he said that, 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 that God's glory is the going public of God's infinite worth. It is making known God's worth. That's what God's glory is. Making known God's worth. The holiness of God is the, is the infinite, infinite value, intrinsic worth of God, and the glory of God is the public manifestation or display of all that value. The glory of God is us in creation showing the world the worth of God. That's why He's portrayed as radiant. That's why we associate it with such bright light. That's why it's described in words that we can hardly even fathom the meaning of. That's why the miracles of God display His glory. That's why Jesus Himself is the embodiment of that glory. Think about this. God entered through time and space and became a man. And now God and man are fused together forever in the eternal Son, Jesus Christ. God's glory is visible manifestation of His infinite worth. And that's why we were created in His image. Do you realize that? We all get twisted up. Does that mean we look like God? No. It means you were created to reflect Him. You were created to reflect His worth. We were created to demonstrate His worth. That's why we value human life. By the way, 
You can't have a high view of God and not value human life. You understand that, right? We value human life womb from the tomb. That's why we're pro-life, is because we value the glory of God. Every human being has been created in the infinitely valuable inf- image of God. That should change the way you see people, by the way. I'll say that again. Every human being is created in the infinitely valuable image of God. Every human being. And by that itself makes them valuable. Because it reflects His glory. But then, when you put your trust in Christ, you're not called to just passively bear the image of God in that glory. You are called to actively bear the image in that glory. That's why Jesus says, you are the light of the world. You're the glory of God, the intrinsic worth of God. His holiness, His goodness is supposed to be reflected in your life. God's glory is to be evident in your life. You, by your relationship with Him, should be a radiant, visible manifestation of His worth. He says that you are the light of the world. And I want you to see that. You are the light of the world, not a light, but the light, the light of God that is in you. So let it shine. Let it be seen. God's glory should be shown in your actions. And then he says, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. The glory of God is to be, is not to be concealed by your life. But it put on a stand, on display, the glory of God is to be displayed. And the reason for that, it says, because it gives light to all in the house. It's supposed to give light to everyone around you. It's supposed to give light to all others around you so they can see what? The goodness of God. So they can see His beauty and His worth. We're supposed to shine so others can see the glory of God. And because of that, come to Him. And receive life as well. In fact, Jesus says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and as a consequence, give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Again, I'll say this one more time. Your salvation and your relationship with Him is about Him and His glory. And because of that, the light of God shines in you. Tristan, you understand that, right? They're supposed to see the light of God in you. They're supposed to see that and be attracted to that. So what? So, so, so they can what? Hear the gospel of Christ. And that way they can repent and believe the gospel and receive justification by grace through faith in Christ alone. Again, for what? God's glory. God's value. God's worth is ultimately the reason why justification is even possible. You might think, well, okay, I agree then. All right, I get it. I, you know, you walked me through all this theology. I know that I'm saved for God's glory. And I see that my life is supposed to glorify God. But how does that even work that's supposed to bring me enjoyment? I mean, that just seems like such an odd thing to add on to the end of that. I mean, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. But how does that even fit? It seems like, in fact, me enjoying God seems almost kind of selfish, right? It seems like it, you know, if I'm going to enjoy God, I'm making it about me and not Him. Well, I want you to think about this. How do you truly enjoy anything? How does something in your life actually bring joy to you? My children and my grandchildren, they bring me great joy. I enjoy them so much. My little grandson, when he says, Papa, the world around just kind of dissolves and melts away. Right? Right? Why do I enjoy him and and enjoy them so much? Because they're important to me. It's about value, right? They're valuable to me. 
They, they have great worth to me. That's why I enjoy them. In fact, a certain part of my life would be empty with, without them, right? And, and the same with yours, right? Same with your spouse and your friends. I like to go fishing. I get great joy out of fishing. I promise you that. I love it. But why? Because the experience of fishing, the experience of sitting there, minding my own business, the experience of feeling that tug on my line is of great value and worth to me. That's why I'll spend money to go fishing because that experience is valuable to me. Everything we enjoy, everything that we that brings us joy ultimately is rooted in the worth that it has for us. So how do you enjoy God? How do you enjoy Him? Value Him. You value Him when you worship Him. Value Him when He's present. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know those times when you feel God close. And then those times when He's not so close, it seems. And how desperately you want that closeness back. Tell me I'm wrong. Value His presence. Value all that He's, His, his fellowship. Value His His life-giving grace because you're saved by grace. Value His mercy. Value the beauty of His creation. When you step outside, you realize that He made that so you would glorify Him. Value His goodness and all the wonderful things He's given you. Value the fact that He's promised you, you, that He will never leave you or forsake you. Value the fact that He has promised that He's going to prepare a place for you. And that He's going to come back for you. Value the fact that He loved you so much that Christ Himself willingly went to the cross for you. He lived a perfect life that you couldn't live on your own and took upon Himself your horrific sin on the cross and endured in His body the awful and terrible wrath of God in your place. Value the fact that He washed away all of your sin, not some of it, all of it. Value the fact that through Christ, His righteousness has been given to you, and now you can stand without fear before God, and you can approach the throne of grace without any fear at all, but boldly come. Value the fact that you were once dead in your sins and trespasses, but by faith, you now have eternal life. Value that that there's kind of been a time when you will not be separated from Him ever again and that you will be with Him face to face forever enjoying Him. What an amazing, glorious, wonderful God. Because think about this, the very act of glorifying Him ultimately brings greater and greater gifts and unending joy to us. And that's the truth. And that's what we need to live in light of. God saved me so I can glorify Him in front of the world. And in the process, my life becomes filled with overwhelming joy that comes from being saved by His grace for His glory. Living a life that's not about me ultimately is best for me. It's just mind-blowing. What an amazing wise and wonderful God indeed. In fact, let me just share with you one more time Paul's words of worship. He says, Oh, the depth and the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable His judgments and how unscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counselor? Or who has given Him a gift? Given a gift to Him that He might be repaid for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. If you're not a Christian, if you have not put your faith and trust in Christ, I want you to realize the life that you're living right now, there is no amount of glory that you will ever have that will ever fulfill the hole that you have in your heart. There's no amount of fame or money or relationships or satisfaction you can have that will ultimately give you lasting joy. You might have happiness for a moment, but you cannot have joy. 
But the promise is that if you will turn and repent and believe the gospel today, you can have joy right now. You can have the joy of the Lord that will, because the Holy Spirit will come and live inside of you forever. If you will repent and believe the gospel and trust that Christ has done for you. And I'm calling you today that if you have not trusted Christ today, repent and believe the gospel today. And if you need help learning how to do that, then talk to me or one of the deacons after the ch- after church and we'll be happy to, to, to help you. But if you're a Christian in a post COVID-19 world, in a world we know that's not going to make any sense to us, in a world that's going to continue to change and it's going to continue to challenge us and going to continue to push back against the message of the gospel, Christian, rejoice that it was through God's divine plan that He chose to save you by His grace through faith in Christ and it was for His glory. And the result of that was for your unending joy. You were saved by grace through faith because God said, I am glorified in saving you. You've been listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead, a production of First Baptist Church in Boron, California. Our website address is fbcboron.org. And would you please consider partnering with us financially as we work to share the hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and our world.